Everybody coming out of prison should have an opportunity to make a new life. We were jaded. We're used to this. We didn't think it was going to change. I said, well, what are we supposed to do? When I go into a soup kitchen, I see opportunity. What I was being led to do was find a way to love these people. We are actually guardians of this community. What was going on with the world today? What was the problem? They wanted to give them dreams. You can be whatever you want to be. I watched the life come back to his eyes. We thought we have to work hard. I knew hundreds of women that just need a hand up. Even if it can't be done, it should be done. My world got bigger. I see a human being who now has some hope. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick, but we can fix this and we should. Thank you. It is so great to be here with you. As you know, Howard, I've been a long-term admirer of yours and the work you are doing and demonstrating how you can be the CEO of an incredibly successful brand and at the same time make a true difference in the lives of people around the world. And Rajiv, absolutely great to meet you too. And uh, I've loved your work, uh, amazing journalist. You know, you've come from covering war zones around the world uh, to working with Howard in helping change the way people prioritize their lives. So thank you both for being here. And this is very exciting what you are doing. Uh, so tell us how it started. Tell us about your partnership. And uh, how did you come up with a name? Do you want to start? Okay, um, let's start with the name, Upstanders. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we were having, uh, in Starbucks parlance, open forums, which are town hall meetings around the country, and those meetings at the time were all about what was going on in the country with regard to racism. And in one of those meetings, a Starbucks manager in Los Angeles stood up and said, you keep talking about not being a bystander, Let's talk about what it would mean to be an upstander. And that, that really s stuck with us all. We didn't know at the time that we were going to do something like this. But the name upstander really speaks to the importance of citizenry. And I think uh, whether we are Republican or Democrat or independent, uh, we all can recognize at this moment in time that the country has gone through really an awful demonstration of civility uh, with regard to the vitriolic, uh, mean-spirited bitterness of this campaign season. And I think in many ways it has clouded what we all believe to be the promise of America and the American dream. And so Rajiv and I started thinking about there's so many ordinary people in America doing extraordinary things, but yet those stories unfortunately do not see the light of day. And so we set out and we said, let's, let's find these stories. And Rajiv, since he's such a wonderful journalist, went out and he found hundreds of stories. And these stories, one after another, demonstrate a deep sense of humanity, a deep sense of understanding the importance of helping thy neighbor, and also very creative, innovative solutions. And I think we're living at a time right now where we can't wait for Washington. We all recognize we've got fractured leadership. Uh, we've, we've seen so many false promises. And I think it's at a time in America right now where citizens need to answer the question, what is the role and responsibility that we have ourselves? And Upstanders is emblematic of so many extraordinary things that ordinary people are doing. Ariana, this isn't our version of you know the Starbucks Hero Awards. While the protagonists of these 10 stories are heroes in our book. We really wanted these stories to be about ideas and ideas that can scale for the good of the country and how we at Starbucks can use our scale to help share these good ideas. And we wanted people to be able to look at these stories and not see um, something that seems so unattainable. You know, I could never do that. We wanted people to engage with these stories and say, hey, maybe I could do that in my community, or I can learn something from that. Um, I can be a better citizen. 
Uh, and so we, you know, it was a fine balance in finding stories that were both extraordinary, but also approachable, engaging, and broadly inspiring to the country. Because we reject that view that the country, uh, the, the country is flying off a cliff, if you will, uh, which I know has become popular in some circles. Um, you know, and, and certainly, when you turn on the television news or read a newspaper, you'd be tempted to think that, you know, we are a nation that's lost. But when you get out of Washington, when you perhaps stop listening to some of the political coverage and you spend time in cities and towns across this country, you'll see remarkable things happening. And as Howard said, they just don't get a lot of attention out there. And we're not here to, to critique the, the media, I think the, the media, being some, you know, look, we, you, you and I uh, have, have spent many years in the news business, uh, plays a very important watchdog role in our society, a very important one. But there's, there's more to America than the story of the problems. And so we simply wanted to widen the aperture of the modern American experience and make it clear to um, our fellow Americans that there's more to our country than the dysfunction we, we often see. Well, as you know, this has been very important to all of us at the Huffington Post. We call it one of our editorial pillars. We describe it as what's working and putting the spotlight on what's working, not just on the crisis and the problems, can help scale, as you said, the good things happening and uh, create not just copycat crimes, but copycat solutions. So I'm particularly excited by what you're doing and uh, would love to know two things. One, this is a beautiful little book uh, that has 10 of the stories. And um, would love to know, how can people get it? Is it at Starbucks? Can you get it with your venti cappuccino? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the good news is that uh, for many people, millions of people every single day, they're coming to Starbucks and paying with our mobile app that we've invested lots of money over the last few years and really now order on your mobile yeah. app which yeah, is so even we, better even better <laughs> so the the mobile ecosystem at starbucks which exists for payment and other things starting today is embedded with the app of every story and so millions of americans today have already seen the stories viewed the stories and i think we're seeing a a deluge of positive press, both from our customers and social media and, and the press, because I think Americans are longing for the kind of stories that speak to the authenticity of what really, what's going on in the country, as opposed to the bombardment of negative news all day long. And we're trying to tell these stories in a way that um, is uh, broadly approachable to anybody. So each of the 10 stories are told three ways, Ariana. Howard and I have written essays. So you can read them if you want to. Uh, we've created five-minute mini-documentaries, so you can watch them. And we are uh, recording 10 podcast episodes, the first of which goes live today. So if you choose to listen, you can listen to them. So it's very interesting because you are actually now a media company. So uh, this uh, convergence yeah. of brands as media companies and publishers doing native advertising. Uh, Rajiv, as a journalist, where do you see that going? Well, this is, I think, a, a, a bold new future and one that I find very, very exciting. I want to make it very clear, though, what we're doing is not branded content. It's not like what many other companies are doing in the content space. This is not a, uh, a clever or backhanded effort to sell more coffee or promote Starbucks. These stories, the way we've told them, the way we've reported and written and filmed them and recorded them, uh, are at the same, at the same quality level, the same standards that I would have created content for the Washington Post or would create content for the Huffington Post. Um, we, we are not trying to, to, to use this initiative as a way to say, hey, look at the great products of Starbucks. This is storytelling in the public interest. But we recognize that Starbucks is a, is a network, if you will. We have physical stores. We have amazing digital reach. And that's a network on which content can ride. But we want the, the first series that we're launching with Upstanders to really be content that is um, very much aligned with our social impact mission. But 
Howard, and you and I have talked about that before, as the CEO of a major public company with responsibility to shareholders, um, you also realize that this is very good for the bottom line. Not in any way that you are uh, producing content which is compromised by the association with the brand, but millennials especially really want to identify and to buy from brands that stand for something beyond making a profit. So there's nothing wrong with this being both good for the country and good for Starbucks, is there? No, I think this is a very important point. I, I would submit that the, the number one characteristic in building a great, enduring brand in any business today is the currency of trust. Trust with your people, trust with your customers, and obviously trust with the shareholders. But in addition to that, I think the rules of engagement, especially for a bricks and mortar retailer today, as a result of the Amazon effect and e-commerce and mobile commerce, there are a lot less people physically shopping in the streets and in the malls in America and around the world today. So what does that mean? That means that every retailer must create a primary reason for their customers to come to their stores as opposed to just intercepting traffic. The experience that we create has to be uh, multi-sensory, not only selling coffee, cr creating fantastic customer service, but also engaging the customer in an emotional way, both in our stores, in digital, and ways in which we can be as relevant outside of our stores as we are inside. A number of years ago, uh, many people who cover the company said Starbucks is, has becoming a tech company because we became so good at creating this mobile application and this mobile ecosystem and the flywheel effect of what it meant for the bottom line. The truth is, we're, we were never engaged in becoming a tech company, but in trying to become relevant with millennials and our core customers. We had to recognize early on that we had to make significant investments in technology and specifically in the mobile application. The same is true now. We're not going to become a media company, but every consumer brand must have the capability to be as good in their ancillary aspects of customer touch points as they are in their core business. And the last piece of this is we all have to answer the question, what is our core purpose and reason for being? and then answer the question in the affirmative that any of these actions or strategic points of view, like, like upstanders, does it thread back to the core purpose and reason for being? And in our case, we're constantly asking ourselves, will this initiative make our people and our customers proud? This is not going to make Starbucks more money. It's not. However, uh, we have been a very successful public company over many years, Performance is the price of admission, and I think people recognize that all these things ladder up to the equity of the brand, the equity of the experience, and what we're trying to do to maintain our relevance, not only in the U.S., but in 75 countries around the world in 25,000 stores. And the question is, how do we do that? And we have to kind of reject the status quo, push for reinvention and self-renewal. And also, I think, and this is important, not everything's going to work. And as soon as some, something does not work, the answer is fail fast and move on. Well, and in a sense, it's a continuation of what you've been practicing and how you've been leading for a while. When you were among the first to provide health care for part-time employees, yes. and uh, even though your share, many of your shareholders complained, in a sense, you were establishing a principle that when you take care of your people, they will take care of your customers, and that's good for the brand. I love the connection between the two, because I feel if you're going to get more people following you, more CEOs following you, it's good to demonstrate that it's actually beneficial to the brand, and not just something that Howard and Rajiv are doing because uh, they're good philanthropists. Well, and I think in large part the success that we have enjoyed is directly linked to the fact that the lay customer today has so much information and so much insight into a company's practices, not only the features and benefits of the product or how much things cost, but also the values of the company. And I think there's so many choices and we all have competition. The consumer today wants to support those companies whose values are compatible with their own. 
This year, when we provided free college tuition for every single Starbucks person, and we paid for it, the level of pride and adulation and relationship between our customers and our partners, those scores went up, and our business went up. Now, that wasn't the intent, but the manifestation of the things we're trying to do as a company, which are not all based on the bottom line over many years, have proved to be successful and have added value to the market cap and shareholder value. So let me ask you something about the upstanders. OK. Uh, they cover everything, you know, from uh, college for everyone, uh, uh, dealing with inmates after they come out of jail, um, the Muslim Americans, you know, so, so many pain points in our society. Uh, I have a favorite. Um, are you allowed to say if you have a favorite? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so my favorite are the inmates. Uh -huh. There is something to me about redemption and the fact that so many people go to jail and uh, have really no other chance in life. And uh, acknowledging that Somebody made a mistake, sometimes even a dreadful mistake, and can get another chance. And the way this amazing upstander that you are profiling Susan Burton. is now helping 900 former inmates really touched right. me. And I highly recommend everybody watches that video. But can you, oh, as Steve, proud you parents, say what's your favorite? You're asking me to like pick among children here. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to ask Howard to well, pick among his children. Uh, there. Um, well, uh, one of the stories that I think really, really resonated with me is set in the town of Baldwin, Michigan, which is halfway between Grand Rapids and Traverse City, a, a very poor rural town where not long ago, on a given year, they were lucky if. 25 to 30 percent of the high school graduates went off to some form of college. In fact, more of them would wind up on public assistance within four years than getting a college diploma. And uh, back in 2008, they heard about uh, what another Michigan city was doing in creating a scholarship program for all of its kids to go to college. And it was endowed by a couple of wealthy philanthropists. So they Folks in Baldwin, displaying great initiative, went knocking on doors with c companies and foundations to try to create a scholarship program for their own town. But it was the height of the Great Recession, and everybody turned them down. So they came back to their town, they lick their wounds, but they're undaunted. And so the good people of Baldwin go and start knocking on their neighbor's doors. They hit up the churches and the Rotary Club. They go and ask the teachers and the police officers and the firefighters to contribute. Everybody does. And they raise enough money to create a scholarship program to give a $5,000 a year scholarship for four years to every student who graduates high school in Baldwin. And this year, 90% of the, the high school graduates in Baldwin are going off to some form of college, mostly four-year institutions. Now, if I may, we're, we're actually really fortunate to have two folks from Baldwin here today. Um, and if they could stand, Ellen Kearns, who uh, helped to raise the money for the Promise Scholarship Program, and Shadaria Scott, who is Baldwin High School class of 2016. And this week is her first week at Eastern Michigan State University. And she's missing her first week of classes to come here to New York. That's fantastic. I love that story. Howard, will you tell us if you have a favorite? <laughs> Spending the day with the two of you yesterday, I, I, I don't want to repeat what Rashid just said, but I'm so moved by what you all did in Baldwin, and I just, I just think it's so important for other municipalities to understand the power of one individual to make a difference in the lives of so many other people. There could be no better story than Baldwin. Oh. Oh. Ariana, your point about redemption is a really important one, and it's a theme that's in several of the stories. Susan Burton, obviously the woman you talk about, who's helped 900 other women who've been released from prison and jail in California find a, a footing and a, and a new life and to avoid going back into jail. She herself spent 20 years in and out of prison after her son was killed, and she fell into a life of drugs and crime, and she's decided 
that she really needs to just dedicate her life to helping other people. We profile a young man in Newark, New Jersey, who dropped out of high school in the ninth grade, again, drugs and prison, has dedicated his life to helping youth in Newark who have dropped out get their high school equivalency degrees and uh, get a new footing in life by helping to rebuild homes in Newark that are given to low-income folks, or the former NFL player who battles his own addiction and overcomes that and today has devoted his life to helping our most seriously wounded veterans, folks who've lost one, two, three limbs, get strong again, and he trains these individuals. We saw a couple of the little clips in that video. Again, he, he was at rock bottom, and he climbed out and now he's showing us what it means to be an upstander. So one last question before we open it up to the audience. And that has to do with the fact that we are two months away from one of the most divisive, racist, and substance-free elections we've ever witnessed. So is there anything about the timing of releasing upstanders that wants to give us hope mm -hmm. that in the middle of this um, incredibly dispiriting uh, campaign time, we can actually gain confidence in the future of our country by watching and celebrating the upstanders? I'm glad you asked that question. I, I don't think when we started, the idea was to release the series and coincide it with the last kind of sprint of the election season. But I think the timing of it does turn out to be very fortuitous for all of us. Um, the way you described it, I would even say it uh, a little bit worse than that. I, I think for all of us who have witnessed the last six months to a year, it's beyond divisive. Uh, it's embarrassing. It's almost disgusting uh, what we have seen, what we have witnessed. And whether you are Democrat or Republican, the lack of civility, the lack of respect. Uh, the rhetorical question I've asked many, many times is watching these, this campaign season, what do you say to a young person who's so influenced and imprinted by somebody who's actually running for president, that level of behavior? How do you coincide that with the kind of parenting necessary to provide a good set of values and behavior when this is what is going on? So. I think, uh, for me, um, I, I, I talked earlier this morning about the lack of civility and the lack of statesmanship. And I referred back to 1968, uh, on the eve of MLK's assassination, when Robert F. Kennedy in Indianapolis uh, got off the plane and did not know what occurred until he actually got off the plane. It was a campaign stop when he was running for president. And they said, you can't go out there. Uh, it is going to be a riot like you've never seen before. And he went and stood on a flatbed truck with no notes and talked about love, compassion, empathy. And he literally single-handedly took an entire city, an entire, entire community, and calmed them down on the basis of common respect and decency and his words. While the he rest quoted Aeschylus. It's amazing yes. to imagine that he quoted Aeschylus. Uh, and now, if you compare that lofty rhetoric to the language being used in the campaign, it's just staggering. It's, it's hard to believe that not only have we not gone forward, but we've actually gone backwards, especially when you consider the issue of racism in America since 1968. But the point you're making is, I think our hope and our intent is the backdrop of what we are all seeing. There is an opportunity to be hopeful about America, to be optimistic about the country, and not kind of allow ourselves to get sucked into the fool's gold and the divisiveness of what people are saying when there are not thousands, but millions of Americans every day ordinary people who do extraordinary things, and that's what needs to be celebrated, and that's what I think needs to be modeled. And so I'm very proud of what we're doing. Uh, this is not for marketing, it's not for money, it's for trying to do what we think is right and use Starbucks scale for good. Thank you so much for what you Thank you.
So now, to you, the audience, who has a question? Yes. Hi. Um, how do you decide what makes a good story for upstanders? Good question. Uh, well, the <laughs> first thing to note is that, as, as Howard mentioned earlier, uh, when we started scouring the country for these stories, uh, there was no dearth of them. Uh, and we should all be take some comfort in knowing that. Uh, they're not just 10 upstanders out there in America. Uh, but we had uh, two criteria that we, we placed, in addition to wanting to, to, to show a degree of geographic and subject matter uh, and, and race and gender diversity. Uh, the first was we wanted our characters to be confronted with a choice, that, you know, that fork in the road, if you will. And there was, the, there was the easy path that they could have taken or the more challenging path, but the, the, ch the path of an upstander. And so each of the stories have this choice element in them. And the other thing that was important to us is that the stories be more than just about a person or a group of people or a community, that they're also about an idea and an idea that we can all learn something from and an idea that might uh, be wise to replicate around our country, or at least be inspired from. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we, we identified those two criteria as, as really important in selecting our stories. Great, next question. So uh, Howard, I was just curious, um, with all this good stuff you're doing, would you ever consider, as a former Canarsie High School graduate myself, Wow. Come back to Canarsie. To come back to Canarsie. To help out over here. Uh, you know, we've done a number of things in the borough of Brooklyn, but as you and I both know, Canarsie is not uh, Williamsburg. Uh, nothing would please me more than be able to do things in Canarsie that would elevate that community. We talked earlier today about we just opened a store in Ferguson, we just opened a store in Jamaica, Queens, and I think Canarsie easily fits into that opportunity as well. And I. I have uh, very fond memories of growing up in the projects in Bayview, and as you and I both know, Brooklyn, our Brooklyn, never leaves you. Um, Howard, I thought that this question was going somewhere else, so let me ask it. Yeah. I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought the question was going, would you ever consider running for president? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Ariana's asked me that many times, both uh, publicly and privately, and uh, I, I kidded this morning, I, you know, I'm still a young man, and who knows what will happen in the future. Yes. Hi. Hello, my name is Adrian, and I was just recently in Africa, in East Africa, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, and as you know, you guys get a lot of coffee from Africa. Have you ever considered doing stories from outside of the world, like for example, those farmers who live under a dollar a day and source coffee and use tech? Because I've, I've seen amazing things happening in Africa. Uh, we, we buy a tremendous amount of coffee from Africa and uh, have done a number of things to raise the wages of what we're actually paying for coffee. We, just for, as an opportunity, just to understand, we pay a significant premium over the spot market to ensure the fact that we are actually making sure the money's getting in the hand of the farmers. In addition to that, we've opened agronomy offices throughout, throughout Africa and mostly recently in conjunction with the president of Rwanda uh, to do things there. We have stories uh, actually on Starbucks website of many things that we're doing in Africa uh, and we hope to open up stores in Africa at some point. We have this year opened stores for the first time in Johannesburg in South Africa and later this year, we'll open in Cape Town. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Howard. Just want to ask one thing. As each and every street, like e every next street is having a Starbucks, and everybody next to you is drinking a Starbucks coffee. Now, what will be your next strategy to move forward? As everywhere there's a Starbucks. So what will be the next target? Uh, well, I think our strength over many years has been our discipline and our focus on our core business. So I think we, we believe we've got a long runway for growth and development in coffee and the things that we do. Uh, I don't think you'll see us do many different things that, that kind of sway away from our core business at this point. Having said that, the experience will be elevated significantly. 
we opened a 15,000 square foot magical place called the Roastery in Seattle. We're under construction right now on a 25,000 square foot site on the corner of 9th and 15th at the Chelsea Market. We're under construction in Shanghai with the same thing. And when, when those things open, it's like the Willy Wonka of coffee. You will not believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was telling Howard how I was um, in Mexico City on Saturday morning having my Starbucks. And I loved seeing how embedded in the culture the Starbucks experience is. So you get both. You get knowing exactly what you're going to get with your venti single shot cappuccino, which is my favorite. <laughs> and you also see all these amazing Mexican sweets that you've yeah. never seen before. So I think that's an incredible success of being really local and really universal. But let's end with the upstanders. Thank you so much for what you're doing. You're making a big difference, not just in telling the specific stories, but in making us feel hopeful and optimistic about the future of the country. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you all very much.